Good morning to each and every one of you. We, we're so, so thankful for you. We're thankful especially if you're a guest this morning. Uh, please be sure that we get the chance to see you and spend a few minutes talking with you before you leave. Uh, please know that you're welcome at any time. We'd love to see you back again tonight at 5 even. Tonight is our fourth Sunday. So if you're a gentleman, be sure that you pick out those songs. And ladies, let us know what songs you'd like to sing tonight as well. We look forward to seeing you and, and spending that time singing together tonight. We're going to be in Luke chapter 18. Luke the 18th chapter, if you're going to be turning to that text in your New Testament. Luke the 18th chapter. Hardworking banker was accused of and then convicted of murdering his wife. When in fact, he did not commit the crime. He was not guilty. Ended up being sentenced to prison for life. And while he's there, he notices the morale of the fellow prisoners are pretty low. And there's, there's no real activity in terms of expanding their reading selection or their music selection. And so he eventually convinces the warden for permission to write to the state library board to see if they can give them some leftover books and music and maybe even some donations. And so he begins to write one letter every single week. After 312 letters, several boxes arrive accompanied by a letter. And in that letter is a one-time $200 donation to help with the prison's library. In that letter... Explaining it, they specify, please stop sending your letters every week. And the prisoner says, ha, huh, it only took six years. When's the last time we said it only took six years? But then he smiles and he says, now I'll write two letters per week. And he does, and sometime later, the library board and the state government have worked together and they appropriate $500 annually to go to funding and fueling the library's resources for these prisoners. And they specify, we're doing this to shut you up, to keep you from writing us every week. Now listen to the example of the state library board, the state, and trying to quiet the power of persistence. That short narrative comes from a Stephen King short story. It was eventually made into a major motion picture. But 2,000 years prior, Jesus tells a parable with the same arc to remind us of the power of persistence, especially as it relates to prayer. Because what is true is that even the most cruel or apathetic of people can be worn down by persistence. Here's what habit and what loop we can find ourselves in and thus leverage when it comes to prayer. We understand the power of constantly carrying something we care about to someone we feel can do something about it. When we're convinced this is important and we know this person can do something about it, we keep bringing it to them until they do something about it. So that's what Jesus is going to use as a means to comfort us and to show us the path for finding help from him and from God through prayer. So let's read Luke 18, look at verse 1 to begin with. These are Luke's words. He told them, and it's that imperfect tense we've mentioned in the past couple of weeks, two weeks ago. He was telling them. He was repeating over and over again these principles. He was telling them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. They ought always to pray and not lose heart. Notice the, the pronoun, they. Third person, they. Well, why would they, whoever the they is, why would, would they need to rem, be reminded to pray and not lose heart? We need to answer that question, but answer it somewhat briefly, but you'll just notice maybe in scanning back up at the end of chapter 17. At the beginning of verse 22, you find Jesus talking about what we've come to call the destruction of Jerusalem. He was telling them some very scary things if they were going to be alive around when, the time when these things would happen. And so it's natural they needed this encouragement that would come from the parable about praying because they were going to see some scary things. Now we know from other texts, like Matthew's account especially, he would tell them signs, the disciples knew signs to look for, 
so that they could get out of Jerusalem before it was destroyed. Well, here the emphasis is on some very scary aspects of this occurrence. The night sky is going to be filled like a storm. Lightning is just going to scatter all throughout the sky. It's going to be scary. He compares the destruction to what Noah and the flood was like. He compares the destruction to what the destruction of Sodom and then likewise Gomorrah experienced when fire rained down from heaven. And then he's going to say that for some there will be no escape, which means there will even be death. There will be some who don't listen to Jesus, who don't care about his work and thus don't listen to his signs, and they don't get out and they will die. It will be a place that's marked by death and scavengers. So that's scary. But embedded within that, in verse 25, is something they would have been uncomfortable with too. It would have likely caused them to lose heart. And that is that he says, these things can't happen until after I've been rejected. He's going to die. And so you've got these events that they're probably still not 100% sure he's, what he's talking about, like we are, able to look back at what's happening. And it's their capital city. It's the heart of their nation as a people. It's going to be God's final act of judgment against the corporate people of the Jews. We can see why they might be prone to, quote, losing heart. So why might we lose heart? Are there things that we're afraid of experiencing? Are there things that we've experienced in the past and we're afraid of having to relive them? Are there things we've experienced in the past and we wonder, how can I keep moving forward even though this has happened to me in the past. It doesn't take much effort at all to look around us or look within us and to find things that could lead us to lose heart. We could list any number of things. Every single one of us here today could list one, two, three things that if we give them too much power, they could cause us to lose heart. People can let us down. Circumstances can change. The ways of the world certainly are discouraging. Corruption is real, and real people suffer because of corruption. Losses happen in life, seasons change in life, and they're often painful. Our own sin and its consequences, even repented sin, can sometimes feel too difficult to bear. We can grow weary even in the work of the Lord and think that loving our neighbor and loving one another is so hard. Can we keep it up? Reaching the lost world with the gospel can seem too difficult at times. And so we can find any number of scenarios where we might feel as though I'm about to lose heart. I'm feeling discouraged and growing discouraged. And Jesus gives us an answer for how to keep that from happening. So what Jesus is doing is showing us the direct correlation between an active, constant prayer life and not losing heart. They're inseparable. And it's that phrase, lose heart. That's so key to this series of everyday courage. We reference the verse from 2 Corinthians 4 in verse number 17. Paul says, we do not lose heart. Even though we have an excuse to, our outward self is wasting away as we get older. But we don't lose heart because our inward self is being renewed, how often? Day by day. What's Jesus saying? Don't lose heart by praying always. Or to adopt that phrase day by day. It's by praying always that we can get in and lift up that decline. Hijack is the word we've used. We could end up on this trajectory of decline downward and never know we're headed toward destruction. But when we will pray and pray always and pray day by day, we get to lift that up and keep ourselves from heading toward certain destruction. I'm curious how Jesus would respond. I guess I'm not curious. This, this parable is the answer. But it's interesting sometimes that I feel this way at times, and I feel like I hear it from time to time, that we're experiencing some turmoil or some distress, and we just assume that we're already studying or that we're already praying like we ought, and we cry out and we say, is there not anything else I can do? Well, yes, I do study. Yes, I do pray. What else can I do because this isn't working? What we learn here reminds us that this is always the answer. I would challenge us that when we begin to think that prayer is not enough, we need to grow deeper in our understanding of what prayer really is. 
and grow in our understanding of the God who gives us this avenue of prayer. Because what this parable reminds us of is that God makes himself just as available as anything that can cause us to lose heart is around us and threatening us. Let's dive in now and read the parable. We'll begin, reread verse 1 and go right into the parable. He said to them, or told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The first expectation we see from this parable is simply to pray always. Luke tells us that before he ever records the parable. Pray always. Well, you see, that's what the widow does. She goes to him continually. And then when he finally relents, the judge, he explains why. It's because she kept coming to him. And he admits, she's going to wear me down if I don't give in to her. Me putting her off is not stopping her. So she becomes this example of not losing heart. She doesn't give up on her case, even though he, to that point, has not yet responded to her. Have you ever noticed how often we're commanded in the New Testament to pray? Always. Not just to pray. We should really assume if we're just told to pray, we should pray always. But God connects those two often. Pray and pray always. Romans 12, verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. He commands us to constantly pray. Ephesians 6, the last part of this armor of God, put on this, take on this, and pray. Do so while you pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert. So that's echoes of not losing heart. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Colossians 4 and verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer. Being watchful, again, that's not lose heart, in it with thanksgiving. Continue in prayer would mean always. Continue steadfastly in prayer means you don't give it up. You hold on to it and you remain strong in your always praying. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning of verse 16, rejoice always. Look through your circumstances and see the truth beyond them. That's rejoicing. Pray without ceasing. Don't ever stop praying. Give thanks in all circumstances. What's the will of God? The will of God is that we do these things always in Christ Jesus for you. It's his will that we always keep praying. We pray for the will of God. And it's also the will of God that we pray. But then there's a bit of a transition into our next idea and what's... Jesus' emphasis in this parable. Listen to how he closes this book and this paragraph here in 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, at his return. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. So immediately after saying, pray always, you get a glimpse as to why Paul says, we do pray always. It's the goodness of the character of God. Because of what God is actively doing for you and preparing you for his son's return, you keep praying and praying always to him. So be like the widow. The widow doesn't lose heart. Be like her. Even though the judge is not like God, you be like the widow. So that brings us to our next idea. We look to God. We don't look to the judge we look to God because God always gives justly. See, there's a, there's a different approach in this parable. Jesus is not saying God is like the judge or the judge is like God. The judge in this parable is a foil to God's character. There's an emphasis made by contrast. The point is, since 
even an ungodly, unloving judge would eventually give in? Look what our loving God will do. Look what he will do to respond to those who are precious in his sight. See, there's a gap between the character of the judge and the character of God. But there's also a gap between how God views us as opposed to how the judge would have viewed the widow. God views us as his special chosen, his elect. Whereas he viewed her as this outcast widow who was a dredge on society. We need to be clear about this. What Jesus is saying is that to go to God in prayer, praying to God, is what separates true prayer from our thoughts, from our wishes, from our wants, from our worries. We speak to God about his will because we understand that God's will is what's always best. That's referenced in the scripture reading from this morning from Psalm chapter 9. The Lord sits enthroned forever. He has, enthroned, or he has established his throne for justice. Why does he reign? For justice sake. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. And so what this is doing is it's releasing this tension. We understand, and rightly so, that it doesn't take us long to recognize there are things in this world that are not right. Maybe within our own lives, maybe around us. But even if we find ourselves in a good season, having a great day, and we're, we're content, and things, life is great, we can look and quickly find examples of seeing that life is not, quote, right in this world. So we get to go to the one who does make right, who can make right now, and who will make right at his son's return. Brother Dan Winkler talks about prayer and specifically the crying aspect of prayer, the tears that often come in, in difficult prayers. Talks about it like the release valve on a pressure cooker. I'm guessing there are some over the past couple of weeks or months who've made the most of a pressure cooker because you've harvested your garden and you've canned those vegetables and you may have used a pressure cooker to get those cans sanitized and shelf stable. Maybe you have some experience using a pressure cooker to cook some some meat that's a little more difficult to break down and you want to speed that process up. It's very important that you release that valve before you try to open that lid because that pressure could cause it to explode. You leave it unattended too long. You better be careful because that pressure could cause it to explode. We recognize we live in a world where everything's not right. Everything's not just. The more we take on those emotions and we bury them deep within... The less we talk about them, the less we pray about them, the more power we're giving them to build up and eventually to release that pressure in an unhealthy way instead of constantly bringing them to the one who knows how to help and who wants to help us through them. We're always going to find ways in life that we wish these circumstances were different or were better and it'll quickly lead us to feeling helpless to do anything about making them better. But we get to bring them to the God who promises to make them better and to make them right. But also notice, we mentioned there's a gap between the judge and God. God's this great, mighty, just God and judge. But there's also a gap between the relationship. Right? This widow was this outcast of society. She wouldn't have been the most prized client of this judge. Well, there's a different relationship between us and God. We are, in this text, verse 7, called his elect. And it's because we are his special people, we do not have to beg to get the attention of God. She did to get the attention of this judge. But God hears us because of who we are in his sight. He longs to hear from us because of who he makes us to be in his son. When we approach God in honest, humble prayer, we are not the squeaky wheel. This lady was serving that role for this judge. But that's not what we do in prayer. We cry out to our Father, to the just creator and judge of this world, who longs to hear from our hearts. Listen to how Paul describes this relationship of being elect or chosen. He's going to tell us to put on compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, patience. But listen to how he does that. Put on then as God's chosen one. Same word as elect in Luke 18, verse 7. His chosen ones. How does he define chosen Holy and beloved. See, God makes us holy through his son, Jesus Christ. 
He sets us apart. He makes us special. We're holy like He's holy. But He also calls us His beloved. We're His special people. A term He would often use for His nation, the, the Jews, the Israelites. We're beloved. He has endeared Himself to us. He longs for us. He welcomes us and invites us. So just think about that for a minute. We're able to approach Him in prayer. We're made holy. And we're invited and welcomed to approach Him in prayer because He loves us so much. Now think about why this is so important as we challenge ourselves to pray daily. We don't deserve access to Him in prayer because of our sin. And yet through Jesus Christ, He makes us holy so that we can approach Him in prayer. When we submit to the gospel, we now have this privilege of prayer to talk to Him, to open out open up our hearts and pour them out. And he keeps hearing us even though we are imperfect. But then second, he wants to hear from us because we are beloved. See, we're special because of him. We're holy. But we're also special to him. He wants to keep hearing from us. He wants to hear from us big or small, daily in a regimented way, but also in key moments of life change and loss and heartache gives us this opportunity and he wants us to use it to come to him. Now quickly, as we wind this down for ourselves, we need to notice the importance of verses 7 and 8 for our application. If we find ourselves just struggling to develop this prayer of habit daily, verses 7 and 8 are key. Let's reread them. Will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him, how often? Day and night. I tell you, Will he delay long over them? No, is the answer. Verse 8, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Do you hear the pain of that question that Jesus asked at the end of verse 8? Here's the promise. God will not delay. God longs to hear from you as his elect. But nevertheless, will he find such faith? See, our exercise of prayer reflects our trust in God. Is he the God of justice such that he longs to hear from and act in our best interest? When we truly believe that, our daily prayers will reflect that belief. So when he returns, will he find a faith that's always praying? If we're going to actively involve ourselves in this prayer life, we're going to recognize there's in, in, un, injustice happening all over the world. There's injustice happening around. There's weakness and injustice within me, and I'm crying out to the one who makes right. The more comfortable we get with this life, the less prone we will be to crying out to the one who truly makes right. That means the less often that we think this world is not my home, the less often we will cry out to the God who's in heaven. And likewise, the more often we remember this world is not my home, the more often we will cry out to our God who is in heaven. We cannot grow so comfortable with God that we begin to think, well, he's this vending machine. I can go up to him and through prayer I can hit A5 and that'll give me this snack and that'll hold me over until I get back home and then I can make everything right. It's through our daily relationship with him through prayer that we're constantly begging to align ourselves to his will, knowing that he is the one who makes things right. And so we ask, will the Lord, when his final return, when he finally once and for all brings the ultimate good, the ultimate justice, will his return be an answer to our praying? And will he return during the act of us praying? This seems so simple, but yet it's so profound and, and it's, it's stepping all over my toes just by thinking about it. But what's necessary for Christ to find us praying when he returns? That's what he asks. Nevertheless, I know the draw and the pull is going to be for you not to pray. So I'm begging you to know you have to pray always. If we're going to be in the act of praying when he returns, what does that demand? It demands praying always so that he finds us exhibiting this faith and trust upon him through all things and about all things that we experience. Now quickly, what can we do to, to move forward with this habit daily? What's one thing we can do to 
to begin to change it if we haven't established it. Do our best to get the prayers out of our head. This is probably the single thing that's helped me the most with this the past several years. It's a wonderful thing that God knows our hearts, that he knows our thoughts, that he can hear us even when we don't speak them out loud. He does, and he can. But if we grow too comfortable with that, and that's the only way in which we pray, we're missing out on an opportunity to bring those words to life. You ever had a thought that sounded good, and then you say it, and then you realize, whoa, that wasn't very smart? Well, the reverse can be true, too. We have a thought, and it's maybe a good thought, but we say it, and oh, wow, that is true. That does mean so much more. That's the power of getting our prayers out in the open. Give them life. So speak them. Write them down. Record them. Type them. The more we will bring life to our thoughts of prayer, the more we will give that power to those words. It'll help us to differentiate prayer between worries and opinions and wants and wishes. It'll help us to release and experience the emotions we are feeling, as we talked about a moment ago instead of just allowing those emotions to build up and to go unreleased. And then think about this with technology now. The more we record our prayers and track them, now look at the ability we have to go back and to review them. Not for selfishness sake, but to see the faithfulness of God and how he's answered our prayers and how he's strengthened us and helped us in various seasons of life. Then we take that one step further. What a blessing it becomes when children or grandchildren or future generations of the church could go back and to read our prayers and to think, wow, this is the heart of my dad or my mom or my grandparents. And this is the faithfulness of God and seen in their life while they prayed their way through this season or through this moment. Aren't there some people that have passed on we'd love to be able to read their prayer journals? There'll be people who look up to us in much the same way. And what a gift and an opportunity to point them to God in a way that they can review and remember and keep remembering the power of persistent prayer. What about you this morning? Are you a part of this elect, these chosen people who've submitted themselves to Christ? They're in Christ, forgiven and saved. If you're outside of him, you don't have to stay that way. You can change that this morning. We would beg of you to consider him, to study about him and to learn from him. If you're ready to put him on in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, you can make that decision today. We'd love to help you with that. If you need to come back to him as one who's wandered away from him, this time is for you also. And really, whatever need you have, whatever prayer need you have, this time is for you too. We'd love to help you. Use this time as we sing.